at a judge named Gideon. He was a flawed man that God used for Israel to gain victory over the Midianites. A couple months back, we looked at a judge named Samson. He was a flawed man that God used for Israel to gain victory over the Philistines. This morning, I'd like us to look at a man named Jephthah. He's a man who's actually contemporary and judged at the same time as Samson. And he judged in a different place. He judged east of the Jordan, and therefore isn't involved with Samson. Uh, and that's why we don't read of them together. But he's also another flawed man that God is going to use for victory over the Ammonites. But I believe his story is one that is vastly misunderstood because of one event that happened in his life. Let's get a little bit of the background to this story so that we understand what's going on. It's found in the book of Judges. However, the context to it actually began 300 years earlier at the time when Israel was conquering the Promised Land. Here is... Up here is the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea, and Jericho is right there. That's the famous story. Israel conquers Jericho and takes the Promised Land. But, where'd they come from? They came from over here. They were in the plains of Moab, right here. After having taken this, if you take a look at maps in your Bibles, you'll notice that Israel's land isn't just west of the Jordan River, it's also partway east. The tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh wanted an inheritance over here because they were shepherds. And this was very good pasture land. If you take a look at the pictures in our podcast that come along with this, uh, the, with this story when we covered it in Joshua, you'll notice how grass-filled it is. We are, today, a lot of this is desert. A lot of it is. But surrounding here, here are plains. The Jordan Rift Valley over here is very nice pasture land. It is today, too. And and so these two and a half tribes wanted, wanted um, land over here. And Moses said, okay, you can get land over here as long as you help your brethren conquer the land on the west side. If you do that, you can get the land on the east side. Now, how did they get this land? Well, they defeated two kings. Uh, they defeated uh, the kings of Sihon. Sihon controlled the land right about here. And then they defeated another king named Og, and he controlled land all the way up here. He controlled that land, and further north, too, it's off our map. But one thing I would like us to note, in Numbers 21... In verse 24, listen to what land Israel didn't conquer. Then Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok as far as the people of Ammon. For the border of the people of Ammon was fortified. The Ammonites, here is Ammon, right here. It's the country of Jordan today, if you're wanting a regular map that we would know. Ammon, Jordan is their capital. Imagine why it's called similar similar name. But it's Ammon. I'm not saying those people are related, but I'm saying that the land, very similar names. We have Ammon here, but the Arnon River is down here, barely on the map. The Jabbok River is all the way up here. Jabbok River is right here. And so this is what was taken. However, the borders of the Ammonites was not taken. God did not allow Israel to take that land because Ammon and Moab were the sons of Lot. And 
they had an inheritance that God gave them, and Israel was not allowed to take that inheritance away from them. And so, fast forward 300 years, Israel's fallen into idolatry, and God is using the Ammonites to oppress them. 18 years the Ammonites oppressed them. What did they want? They wanted this land. In fact, they claimed that Israel stole it from them 300 years before. And so that's a bit of the history as to what's going on. Now let's come to the man named Jephthah. If we go to Judges 11, that's where we're going to be spending much of the rest of the time uh, this morning in this lesson. In Judges 11, let's get the first three verses. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with them. So Jephthah, he was born of a harlot, a prostitute, and... That wasn't his fault. You can't control your parents. That's one thing children can't control. They can't control whether they are born to a wealthy family, a poor family, middle class family. Can't control what culture you're in. You're born. And that's what you get. Well, Jephthah was born of a harlot, but because he was born of a harlot, his brethren despised him. His brothers despised him. So you're, you're the son of another woman. You're not going to get an inheritance with us. In other words, greed involved there. They didn't want to divide their inheritance. They were legitimate children, whereas you're illegitimate. And so Jephthah, what did he become? He became a pirate. That's what we would call him. He got out raiding. Well, that's what pirates do. Uh, and so Jephthah became a pirate. And so in that, this was not a man you would think God would use to deliver his people. But this is exactly the man God used to deliver his people. He was a mighty man of valor. He, what, we're going to find out he wasn't a faithless man. We may not like what he did, and what he did may not necessarily have been right. But he wasn't a faithless man. So let's move ahead now to the battle with the Ammonites. Israel had a problem. The Ammonites were oppressing them. And they had no one to lead them. Samson, he was dealing with the Philistines on the west side of the Jordan River. He was down near the Mediterranean. He couldn't lead them because he's dealing with the Philistines. People up in Gilead, they really didn't have anyone to lead them. And so what do you do? Well, turn to Jephthah. What was Jephthah's attitude towards this? Let's read verses 4 to 11 of Judges 11. It came to pass after that time the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was, when the people of Ammon made war against Israel, that the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Then they said to Jephthah, Come and be our commander, that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you now come to me when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go fight with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all the words before the Lord in Mizpah. So, Jephthah here, you can understand his attitude. People don't want to be your friend until they're in trouble. And then, when you have something that will help them, then they come to you and want to be their friend. Have you ever had that, where you have the really smart person in class, they're, they're shunned, 
they're, 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 put, they're put off to the side. No one wants to be their friend until they have an important task that you can't understand. Then they want to be your friend. Well, Jephthah had the attitude, well, are you just coming to me because and telling me that I'll be your head while you have a problem? I'm not going to help you then. If, I'm, if I come and battle with you, if we win, am I going to be your head then? And that's what they said. They said that, that he wanted respect for who he was. And for, uh, and that was, I believe, a valid demand. Not, not to use someone. We aren't, we aren't to do that. And so they said, we will do that. And Jephthah led them. Now, we often think that everyone in the Bible's first, their first thought, all right, we're going to go to war. Jephthah wasn't like that. First thought of him was, okay, let's see if we can get the Ammonites to stop oppressing us without war. Read all, all the way down to verse 28, and what you get is Jephthah's attitude towards uh, Jephthah's attitude towards uh, the Ammonites. He says, what have we done to you? What have we done to you to deserve this treatment? He said, if this was your land that you're accusing us of stealing, why in the past 300 years has your God not recovered it for you? They believed in their God, Chemosh. They believed he was all-powerful, and Jephthah was basically mocking them, saying, if your God's all-powerful, why has he let your land be taken by another people and hasn't come back to give it back to you in these 300 years? In truth, it wasn't their land. But the Ammonites didn't care. The Ammonites were a type of people in the days of Jephthah. They wanted what they wanted. And they wouldn't heed Jephthah's call. They wouldn't give up. And so now there's going to be a war. And that brings us to verses 29 to 40 and Jephthah's costly vow. Which is the main point of our lesson today. Let's read verses 29 to 40 of Judges chapter 11. Then the Spirit of the Lord came unto Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he advanced towards the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of my, the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced towards the people of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he defeated them from Aror as far as Minith, twenty cities, and to abel Karamim, with every great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Then she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity for my friends and my friends and I. So he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And it was at the end of two months that she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. What we find here in this passage is that Jephthah was a man of faith. I don't have to wonder if he was a man of faith. Hebrews 11, 32 says he was. But that doesn't mean he was a perfect man either. Men of faith do sinful things from time to time. Jephthah here, what he did was basically he was hedging his bet 
He had faith that God would deliver him, but he wanted to make sure of it. He said, if you will deliver me from the Ammonites, if you do that, I will vow to offer to you a burnt offering, the first thing that comes out of my doors. Now this was a foolish vow. Because, first of all, whether or not he made the vow has no effect on whether God was going to deliver Israel or not. Either God was or he wasn't. He cannot be bargained with this way. He's not going to go, well, if only Jephthah would have vowed to me a vow or offered me an offering, then I would then I would defeat the Ammonites. No, that's not God's attitude. So it was a foolish vow because Jephthah couldn't bargain with God uh, for anything. God was going to do what God was going to do. But second, the vow was a foolish vow because he said he, Jephthah didn't know what the first thing was that was going to greet him. It could be something costly, or it could be something worthless. If Jephthah wanted to vow something, that was his business. He could do that. He could say, I'm, he, didn't, he didn't say, God, if you will deliver me, then I will do this. He could have said, God, when I return from battle and victory with the Ammonites, which you will give me, I vow to offer this, or I vow to do that. It's not conditional on God doing something. It's, all right, God, when you do this, I will do this. But it sh as I said, it shouldn't have been contingent on victory, and it should have been chosen prior. Because remember, sacrificing things to God, sacrifice things to God, that had to be perfect and blameless. I had, hadn't had his word yet. I had to make sure. But uh, that had to be perfect and blameless. You could not offer something to God that had blemish. That God wouldn't accept that. And so Jephthah should have done this. But this is what Jephthah did. The thing is, Jephthah won. Now he won through God. This is, if you want to know what all these cities were, this is the map of what it was started up here in Mizpah, Gilead. And really, all of this is where the battle was. We had Aurora down here. We have, I can't see that name right there, Abel Kiraman right here. And, and oh, I've got to really look up. This is the city of Adam uh, over here. These are where the major battles with the Ammonites were. Those are the victories. That is what Jephthah won. And when he returned, what happened? Well, his daughter came out to greet him first. Now, that should not have been a surprise in one sense. He should have been able to foresee that. Because, as we said, as we find out, she's his only child. It doesn't even appear his wife is alive. She may, she may not be. But his daughter, at least, was the first to come out to greet him. He was distraught. He tore his clothes. For again, she was his only daughter. And then he had this vow to the Lord. And to his credit, he wasn't trying to get out of it. He told the daughter exactly what had happened. And why was he so upset? Well, he knew when he fulfilled that vow. Jephthah would have no children, no grandchildren. Remember, under the law of Moses, usually the inheritance belonged to the sons. However, if there were no sons, it would go to the daughters. That was dealt back in Numbers 36, uh, that daughters would inherit when there were no sons. And so she would have inherited and would have had children, and they would have inherited and carried on Jephthah's name. But now, now because of this vow, he was not going to have any other children. No inheritance to pass on. Jephthah didn't renege on his vow. He didn't go back. For he offered his daughter to God. 
she only asked of him that he grant her two months to go into the mountains with her friends and bewail her virginity. In other words, bewailing is sorrowing. She sorrowed over this fact. And so in the end, it became a custom in Israel for the daughters of Israel to come and lament the daughter of Jephthah four days every year. That's the story. Now, the $64 question is, did Jephthah offer his daughter as a sacrifice on an altar to God? And a cursory reading, just a reading of the text, appears to be yes. But that's the problem with cursory reading. Are we correct in what we read? Is that really what happened? Well, if it is, we know that it is an abomination to God. Leviticus 18 verse 21 says, calls human sacrifice an abomination. God would never accept such. And so what do people who believe that Jephthah offered his daughter on an altar to God as a sacrifice. What do they say about Jephthah? Well, Jephthah must have repented. The thing is, we don't read of that. We read of all the way through Judges. Israel sins, they repent, God delivers. That's what we read of. So, I find the silence on Jephthah's repentance very telling. It goes right into chapter 12. Jephthah is still the judge. And we go on with his story like nothing ever happened. The text doesn't imply that he repented of his vow. And Hebrews 11.32 still calls him a man of faith. So we have a difficult text here. And when presented with the difficult text... It is important that we don't assume we know what the text is saying without studying the whole story. Now, usually we, we say, okay, the whole story, let's go back to the chapter, let's go to the previous chapter, maybe go to the next chapter. This one requires a little bit more study and a little bit more knowledge of the Old Testament. Let's first deal with the laws of sacrifice, vows, and redemption of vows as found in the law of Moses. Let's go to Exodus 13. Exodus 13, let's read the first two verses. It's not that hard, but we do have to put it together. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both men and beast, it is mine. So, what we find here, consecration is dedication. You're given to the service of the Lord. All firstborns, that would be male and that would be female. We often overlook that. We always think, well, it's the male firstborn that was consecrated. No, that's not what it says. It says, whoever opens the womb, the first one to do that. You can be a girl and do that. Everyone who opened the womb, the firstborn to do that, was consecrated to the Lord. Yes, we will find out, out from Numbers 3 that the males were redeemed from service in the tabernacle because the Levites were chosen to do that. If the Levites hadn't been chosen, the males would be responsible for their role in the tabernacle. Every firstborn male. But God selected the Levites, and so the firstborn was still consecrated. Just because they didn't go work in the tabernacle didn't mean somehow that they weren't consecrated to the Lord. They were, and the males were redeemed for a price. So let's remember that. Firstborns, consecrated to the Lord. Leviticus 27, which we're not going to read. Uh, well, read, we'll read a couple verses, but we're not going to read the entire chapter. Leviticus 27 gave rules for the concerning vows, including the fact that vows could be redeemed for a price. And that included vows of people. That's what the first part of the chapter says. You could basically vow anything under the law of Moses. You could vow money. 
you could vow property, and yes, you can vow people. You could vow your children. That's what Hannah did with Samuel. You could vow your servants, yourself. But you could also redeem those vows. That came with a cost to, to show Israel you shouldn't be making foolish vows. So it did come with a cost, but you could redeem those vows. Except in one case. If we go down to verses 26 to 28 of Leviticus 27. But the firstborn of the animals, which should be the Lord's firstborn, no man shall dedicate, whether it is an ox or a sheep, it's the Lord's. And if it is an unclean animal, then he shall redeem it according to your valuation and shall add one-fifth to it. Or if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord and all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering <coughs> is most holy to the Lord. Go back to Exodus 13. The firstborn of clean animals couldn't be redeemed. They were sacrificed to the Lord already. They were the Lord's. And by extension, what do we have? By extension, what do we have? Well, that would include the firstborn of man. He's mentioned here in verse 26 to 28. They're already devoted to the Lord. The Lord gave an exception for the service in the tabernacle, but that was a one-time event that happened when you were born. That's the example of what happened to Jesus in Luke chapter 2. They went to redeem him from the service. It says so right there. Present him to the temple, that's what they were doing. Because he was the firstborn. But, if the firstborn was vowed again, you weren't going to get to redeem him. Because there was no mechanism for doing that. You couldn't redeem that which was already the Lord's. And that's why Jephthah couldn't go and redeem his daughter from the vow. She was the firstborn. But that still gives us the question, wasn't she still a burnt offering? Wasn't she sacrificed on an altar? Because all we've done so far is to show... Well, that's why Jephthah had to fulfill his vow. Well, let's go to Numbers 15. Numbers 15, I'd like us to get verse 3. Numbers 15, verse 3. And you, may, and you make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or sacrifice, to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering, or in your appointed feast, to make a sweet aroma to the Lord from the herd or from the flock. Well, what we see here is free will offerings and vows were described as burnt offerings here. They could be animals, and sometimes were animals. But free will offerings are not always animals. What happens if it wasn't an animal? If your free will offering that you gave to the Lord wasn't an animal? Or it was something that couldn't be burnt on an altar? Well, let's go to First Chronicles 31. First Chronicles 31, we find that Kor, the son of Imna, the Levite, the keeper of the east gate, was over the free will offerings to God to distribute the offerings of the Lord in the most holy things. The things that couldn't be burnt on the altar because they weren't clean animals, they were redeemed or put into the service of the Lord. And there was someone there, who, who, a Levite there, who was in charge of doing that. So just because we read of something being described as a burnt offering doesn't necessarily mean that it was burnt on the altar. Now why? Well, the burnt offering we need to realize is something that's a little different of an offering. We realize we have the sin offering, we have the trespass offering, we have the grain offering. We also th those sacrifices we generally know what they what they do, but the burnt offering was different. There were certain parts of the sacrifice that would be eaten, especially the peace offering, that would be eaten. Part of it would be burned, the best parts would be burned, but some of it either was eaten by the priest or by the people, except the burnt offering. 
The burnt offering was an offering that was completely offered to the Lord. Burnt offerings are described in Scripture as a sweet aroma to the Lord. And in this sense, if you go to Ephesians 5 verse 2, you find that Jesus' sacrifice was a sweet aroma to the Lord. And in that sense, Jesus was a burnt offering, even though he wasn't burnt on an altar as a sacrifice. He was wholly given to the Lord. Even us, when you go to Romans 12, it's Romans 12 there, if you get my notes later, it says Romans 15, but it should say Romans 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, acceptable to God. It's using that same imagery there, that burnt offering. We are to offer ourselves fully to the Lord, but we aren't burned on an altar. So what we see is that even though the phrase burnt offering is used, that doesn't necessarily mean that the sacrifice was burnt. It was wholly given to the Lord, though. Only those things that could be burnt on the altar, clean animals, only those were sacrificed on the altar. Every other thing was given to the Lord and put in his service. So, Jephthah's daughter, because she was the firstborn, couldn't be redeemed from the vow. And because she couldn't be burned on an altar, that would have been an abomination, was put into the service of the Lord in the tabernacle. Women were useful in the tabernacle. We find them there in the Old Testament. We find them there in the New Testament. She was given to the Lord. Notice that the passage doesn't say that he sacrificed her on an altar. It doesn't say that. People read that into the text. It doesn't say that. It says he fulfilled his vow, which he did. But, she wasn't burned on an altar. And this is why I believe she bewailed her virginity, not her shortened life. She asked for two months to bewail her virginity, not the fact she was about to die. She knew she wasn't going to have children because of this vow. And that's what she wanted to, she wasn't going to get married, wasn't going to have children, and that was something in that time that was very important. Remember, Hannah in, in 1 Samuel was mocked by Elkanah's other wife, Anina, for not being able to have children. Even our society sometimes looks down on married women who can't have children or choose not to have children. Well, what's wrong with you? Well, nothing could be wrong with you. It's your choice, you and your husband's choice, when and if to have children. It's no one else's business as to why. But in that society, you didn't have children. And you were able to, and, and you were of age to do that. Well, that would be seen as a disgrace. And she was mourning because of that. And the daughters of Israel, what would they do? Well, they came to lament. Je they didn't come to lament Jephthah's daughter's death, but the fact that she had no children. This is why Jephthah isn't condemned. We do not read of Jephthah's sin in that regard. We read of David's sin with Bathsheba. It is filled in the Old Testament and even in the lineage of Jesus. When you get down to Solomon, who was the son of the wife of Uriah the Hittite, even in the genealogies of Jesus, we are reminded of David's sin. We're constantly reminded of Abraham's sin when he and Sarah had devised a plan to have a son with Hagar. And that would be the promised son. That was Ishmael. Most of the enemies of Israel in the Old Testament are as a result of that. The Ishmaelites, the Midianites. Those were all because of that sin. And so we have, I guess the Midianites, it's more the Ishmaelites. Uh, than the Midianites. I think the Midianites were a different one. But we're constantly reminded of that. Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it. 
we're constantly reminded of that, even all the way through the book of Judges. The writer of the book of Judges constantly came along and said, Israel sinned, Israel sinned, Israel sinned. And, when it came, and it, it, even, even pointing out some of the judges' failures, the writer of Judges had no problem pointing out sin. And yet with Jephthah here, yes, we see the costly vow, the foolish vow, but we do not see the abomination that would have happened had he sacrificed his daughter on an altar to God. So quickly, uh, two lessons that I want us to take from this lesson today. The first is context, and a whole understanding of Scripture matters. I was uh, on Facebook a few months back. I was chastised, not by anyone here, but I was chastised by some preachers that said, why are you studying the book of Deuteronomy? In the book of Leviticus, in the book of Numbers. Why are you doing that? Why aren't you focusing on your podcast on the book of Romans, and Ephesians, and Colossians? Why aren't you doing that? And I said, well, we are going to get to those books. I'm not leaving them out. There is a pattern I'm following, but you can't study them. You can't understand the book of Jephthah properly, I don't believe. If you have not studied Leviticus, or Numbers, or Deuteronomy, or Exodus, it's not laying a foundation for our understanding of the Old Testament, which will lead to a better understanding of the New Testament. What does being a living sacrifice mean if we don't know what the sacrifices were in the Old Testament? Studying the Old Testament is important. It's not our law. No, it is not. But it can help us understand the covenant that God made with Christ, uh, with us under Christ, when comparing it to the law that God, the covenant God made with the Israelites. Context matters. It sometimes involves chapters and verses that surround it, but sometimes it requires knowledge of other books. It requires reading the language of a passage. As I said, the passage says Jephthah fulfilled his vow did not say he offered her on an altar. Hebrew, the Hebrews who read this first knew what that meant because they knew the Old Testament. We have to have the same knowledge they had if we are to understand this story properly and avoid making incorrect assumptions about the text. That leads to other misunderstandings. You, you run into Hebrews 11. How is Jephthah a faithful man, if he committed such an abomination. Because we don't read of him forgiven. We read of David forgiven. We read of Abraham forgiven. We even read of Moses forgiven. And we can understand how there in Hebrews 11, how is Jephthah there? Because he didn't sin in that regard in the first place. We've charged him with something that God does not. Second lesson. This is a tough lesson. All the promises we make, even foolish and costly ones, need to be kept. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. There we read, Again you have heard that it was said to these of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these, is from the evil one. When I say something, and I tell you something, you better be able to take my word to the bank that that's what I plan to do. If I tell you something in the negative, you better be able to take that to the bank that I will not do that. We shouldn't be making promises we can't keep. Now, we live in a sinful world where we can't always trust the word of people. But that should be the world that is in that case, not us. We aren't to, our speech is always to be truth. If it is not, we need to correct that. Some of us, yes, make foolish promises. But we need to get out of the habit of doing that. 
Jephthah, all he had to do to avoid this situation was not make a foolish vow. Well, if we want to avoid the consequences of making uh, of foolish vows, the conclusion is think before you act. Think before you say something. Because we are expected to perform what we say. Now, people sometimes ask the question, well, what if the promise that I make will lead me to sin? Well, that's not a foolish vow. That's a sinful vow. I think of Saul in the Old Testament. King Saul, when he was fighting the Philistines, he vowed that his men weren't to eat anything until the sun goes down. Jonathan didn't hear the vow. He he ate at the, at the end of the night. And then... <laughs> God wouldn't answer Saul, and so he determined someone must be eaten, and I'm going to kill the man who did. He vowed to do that. And when it was found that Jonathan was going to kill him, uh, well, Jonathan was the one who did it, Saul raised his hand up, he was going to kill him, and the people said, no, you will not do that, because that would be sinful. Now, did Saul sin in breaking his vow? Yes, he did. Would he have sinned had he kept his vow? Yes, he would have. Sometimes we get ourselves into a situation where no matter what we do, we're going to sin. God didn't put us there. We did. We always think, oh, there's going to be a way of escape. Not if I dig the hole too deep. The way of escape was much earlier if we've dug the hole too deep. So... A foolish vow is not going to lead me to sin. It might cost me some pain. It might cost me some money or some time that I won't be able to get back. But a sinful vow we should not be making. So, in conclusion, Jephthah made a foolish and a costly vow. But he kept it because he was a man of faith. For us, serving God is going to be costly but it is not foolish. It is, worth, it is worth it. When we decide to become a Christian, what are we doing? We are making a promise to ourselves and to God, I will follow you and you alone. When we make that commitment, we should not turn back on. It is that important, for it will determine where we will spend eternity. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor